it even fits on this. Well, the first question, obviously, to ask in a extension session, why we are sitting here? Why extension is yield interesting? The second question is why are multi strange antibodies in? Obviously, everyone is talking about them. Maybe that's a mistake. <laughs> Uh, can we really discover coagulum plasma? Or maybe just a, it's just a, another mistake of our ideas. And if, it, if we can, how are we supposed to do it? And what are the conditions under which we are probably going to discover it? Maybe there are things which we cannot discover in principle. And how can actually Grazina be sure that she knows what she has discovered? And then, of course, we have the practical questions, which are perhaps even of great importance. We all have seen very many questions about the dependence of temperature on chemical potential. If there's a phase transition, would, we would like to know where it is, what is its functional behavior. And then if, uh, I invite everyone to brainstorm on issues uh, such as can we determine latent heat using strange particles, color correlation length as a function of temperature. Can we see the temperature dependence of alpha S, MS, and similar, and whatever other question you have in mind. Okay. So I would like uh, to uh, put to with the round table the first question. We shall discuss for five minutes why strangeness is interesting. And to kick off the discussion, for the first question, I'll give an answer. For the others, I won't. You can have, there are two reasons for this. One is that I would have to think that it was too pleasant to think too much. And uh, so I haven't really prepared myself completely. And for other, if I give all the lecture, then we don't need a round table, right? <laughs> so the, the 10 minutes, we will come in. Right. So this is the answer is to the first question. And if anyone disagrees with this answer, I think he wanted to disagree. No? All matter we know is made of uh, U and D flavor. So therefore, the strangeness attack on newly made matter and it is, in principle, also self-analyzing, because, uh, as we all know, strangeness is the case when it leaves the track of its existence. So it is, um, uh, helps us a little bit in our thinking. And finally, uh, by seeing the production of strangeness, we can see the con rate of conversion of kinetic energy to matter. It tells us something about what has happened. If there's more or less effective production of strangeness, it's a message. But I think there's another point, and that is that the, you can also look at things like antiprotons, which are totally created matter. Mm -hmm. But I think the difference between strangeness and antiprotons is that the strangeness is, is, is created in strong interactions, but it's only, you know, it only is destroyed in the weak interactions. So it, 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 it remains as, as, a, as a parameter you can measure, whereas things like antiprotons can annihilate. So I think you have a, with the strangeness, you have a signal that is a persistent signal. So, Well, it's, well, I think the thing is that the strangeness, because, no, the strangeness could annihilate if you had a very high density of strangeness, but I think the fact that the strangeness is a, it's, it has a, a smaller cross-section to, for a, a strange and an anti-strange quarks to annihilate with each other compared to, say, an up and an anti-up. But I guess Berndt has a, has a different idea. Shall, shall I ask Berndt to answer? No, no, no. I, I mean... Uh, the point is that, of course, you need strangeness and annihilation in order to produce thermal equilibrium or chemical equilibrium. So, in that sense, it's not negligible. But in, in principle, Steve is, of course, right. It's a very good point. Kajina, you had? Well, I wanted to just support it, especially now, because we are still talking about baryon-rich area and need rapidity that may change later on. They may become equivalent. I don't know, maybe it's a good time to show the transpines I showed <laughs> on the <laughs> quark matter. So we know why strangeness is interesting. So this is what I show at quark matter. Uh, kind of a review of the situation, the history. So before 88, before we started to do... 60 seconds. 60 seconds. We had a prediction that in the case of coagulum plasma creation, we will have high strangeness production rate. Then we made experiments at CERN 88, and what we discovered in sulfur sulfur collisions, really we have factor two more strangeness than in nucleon nucleon collisions. Uh, 
Then the conclusion was very simple. The simple models which we had at this time, which, are, which were based on the superposition of nucleon-nucleon interactions, are just discarded immediately. Uh, then we look more carefully in the data, and we discover that there is no sign of strangeness enhancement in PA collisions. So again, if we build a model which is a little bit complicated, then the superposition of nucleon on nucleon includes some pre secondary processes which can be present in PA collision, nothing happens. Uh, so this trivial secondary processes are excluded as a source of strangeness enhancement. Uh, uh, last year we reported strangeness enhancement in sulfur silver collisions and what we learned this year is finally that more sophisticated models based on the uh, uh, hadronic processes are also not able to account for the strangeness enhancement. In other words, this was a operational answer to the question. We have a surprise. That's why strangeness is interesting. Well, okay, strangeness is announced that uh, for sure now many experiments have. Uh, uh, Just I'm reminding those who came in late that we are discussing the first question. So uh, the fact that something is announced in itself is interesting, but uh, how interesting is it? Uh, that uh, is still a matter of debate. Huh? It's a matter of debate. Jean, you want to say a word? No, you already had a word. Antinori? Well, I mean, for me, what makes it interesting is the fact that it's enhanced. That's <laughs> also operation definition. Yeah. That's yeah, something new. Is, you want to say something? Yeah. So I will use my second, 60 seconds. The, what's important is uh, that it's not only enhanced, but in sulfur on silver is enhanced as much in sulfur on sulfur. We believe that sulfur on sulfur is so diluted that if you have a heavy system, really condensed like a nuclear core, you will have much more enhancement. Apparently, in sulfur on sulfur is the same uh, kind of enhancement also about factor two. And I think this is a puzzle. It's very interesting. <laughs> well, it seems that we all agree strangeness is interesting. Anyone from the audience wants to contradict? Well, we proceed to the next point. So why is everyone now to, uh, again looking at uh, multi-strange antibaryons? I will start from, from the right to left. I'm not involved in that. <laughs> I, I think we can... I think I should, my opinion is that I should pass it on to the next speaker <laughs> who has an opinion on that. Well, I think the multi-strange anti-baryons is it's just an interesting question at the AGS because we see this um, fairly large yield of anti-lambdas and we just have to understand what that means. Um, I think it's too early to tell. I, I think the trouble is, is that these codes that we have are, we're talking about extremely small cross sections and these codes are really designed for, you know, looking at the global features. So I think we don't have really a model yet as to what the, what the yield should, should really be. But it is interesting that we see these, this fairly large yield of these multi-strange antibaryons at the AGS where we're really right at threshold. Just a little comment about the <coughs> sensitivity of the signal. Um, I'm just preparing something because I was unprepared to show that if you look at single strange probes, the, the signal, in other words, the, the magnitude of an effect of enhancement is always a rather modest one, contrary to what one would dream, because between a world of which con consists of equal number of strange and up-down, and the normal baryonic world where strangeness is suppressed, the, the margin between these two is of the order of a factor two or two and a half. But if you look at, at multiply strange baryons, then you get to the square of this kind of abundance ratios and the production rate. So somehow you, you magnify your leverage. Um, I w would just like to add that one should probably learn from the uh, cheap size suppression. <coughs> and uh, the lesson for me for, or from that is that one has to extremely well understand the basic processes like proton-proton collisions uh, isospin effects, free interactions in the target, and it, once all that is understood, I think one can talk about an enhancement or not in a much more precise way. Uh, I think also that uh, maybe even for the multi uh, strange baryons and antibaryons, the margin is only of the order of a factor of two. 
and so one has to uh, define the uh, enhancement relative to something and this something has a very has to have a very small error bar otherwise it does not uh, become significant they are hard to produce so it's you try to think of something which is hard to produce if you don't go through some uh, exotic uh, state and with a simple assumption, you may think that the probe density of strange quarks, which is the issue here, we know that the net density in quark uh, plasma, in quark gluon plasma, and in hadronic gas are, well, depending of, of hadronization scenario, but they are almost the same, depends how you deal with the time evolution of the system. But this is not a case in terms of multi strange. They are probing density of strange quarks, which is significantly different in plasma and in hadronic gas. So that will remove ambiguity. Well, uh, forgetting for the moment the quark gluon plasma, meaning that after all we have to prove, uh, if you want to create a strange antibaryon in a single, uh, in a single collision, secondary collision, single one, say a strange anti-omega, you need a threshold U 3.2 GV. Now, if you want to create it multiple collision by addition of kaons to antiprotons, uh, then you need uh, three. Uh, three units of strangers, you need at least three, three steps, which is uh, clearly not easy, so... No, with such a good panel, there is nothing left for the last man to say. <laughs> first, no. yeah, first. We invite comments from the... I think for, for, for me the main point of interest would be that it really puts on the stand all the models that have been tuned to explain kaon production or singly strange uh, hadrons and if the basic mechanism how they get the enhancement is right then they should be able to account for multiply strange objects while if the basic mechanism is not right then we should certainly see discrepancies and so, so it really it tests whether trivial explanations of the enhancement are valid or not. I mean, right now where we are, I mean, it depends on, you know, we haven't actually measured the MT uh, dependence of these anti-lambdas, but if the, if the anti-lambdas have the same MT dependence as the lambdas, then we're seeing yields at the AGS, which are 10 times what is predicted by these RQMD models. So that's a, certainly a serious discrepancy. But I say I have to be careful because we did not, you know, there could be a different MT dependence. So. <laughs> Well, I said that, and uh, these guys measured this empty dependence already. Okay. Yeah. You clearly. Empty if you have, okay. if you have, uh, if you have ten or twenty thousand lambda anti lambda, you can easily measure the, the empty dependence. Oh, but so you have. It. Yes. And is it uh, the same? For her, yes, it's not uh, it's too different. Yes. Good. <coughs> Just to keep it in mind. I mean, in, in my mind, the uh, multi-strange baryons and antibaryons actually are important because they sensitively probe whether the thermodynamic equilibrium uh, that is implicit in, in Hagedorn's model and everything that is built on this is um, complemented in the nuclear reaction also by a flavor equilibrium. Well, as far as our thermodynamical or statistical model is concerned, we always deal with chemical and with kinetic uh, equilibrium. There is no difference. We can't differ the two, uh, uh, distinguish the two. At least we never have done. But the guys that are sitting in front do now distinguish the two. I have a naive question. If uh, one uh, finds chemical equilibrium, but for some reason cannot measure the thermal, cannot prove uh, the thermal equilibrium, now will chemical equilibrium be, uh, be enough to say that we have reached thermalization? Very naive question, sorry. This is not possible. You cannot prove chemical equilibrium 
without having thermal equilibrium as a basis to start from, because chemical equilibrium is defined in terms of, a, of an abundance relative to the expected abundance at a certain temperature. If you don't know what the temperature is, you have no statement. May I ask all members of the round table when I speak to rise? No. no. <laughs> I, I will not only rise, but show one. <laughs> no. about, about flavor equilibrium, that brings us back to this question, how far, how, how high can the signal be? If you had an ideal, I'm talking to the jubilar, <laughs> if you had an ideal plasma, you would have equal abundance of up-down strange, basically. So then this famous Froblevsky ratio, which is the ratio of uh, strange quarks to non-strange quarks, would be unity. That would be a limit of flavor equilibrium. But I wanted just to say from then on, of course, then you have a net baryon number in the system which adds ups and downs for a net quantum number. So you, even in such a plasma, you only have 0.85 or something. But then you have gluons too, which carry half of the energy. And when they go to quark-antiquark pass late in the expansion, they will not have this democratic ratio of strange equals up and, and equals down, but they are already reflecting cooling e expansion conditions. So they freeze out with a lambda which is more like 0.4 than 0.8. So in all, what you see after freeze out is a lambda, which is this ratio, which dilutes the flavor equilibrium into something that you can observe, already 0.5. And now, the tantalizingly, the data are now at a point, about 0.35, so we are not quite there, but we are also above some kind of trivial RQMD limit, which is 0.2 to 2.5, which would be just rescattering or what people call cascading, or there are a thousand names of that, which is maybe the reflection of hadronic terminal equilibrium. So that comes back to this previous remark, how, how, how far is the leverage, leverage in this the entire signal? And we are somehow between 0.25, which is still a boring limit, and 0.5, which would be the, the ultimate uh, fingerprint of a flavor equilibrated initial quark gluon plasma. But you can, of course, uh, just to make, give it, Chairman has some prerogatives. Uh, factor 2 to the power 3 is 8, remember that. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree. You can <laughs> enhance that thing, of course. <laughs> Yesterday I was reading uh, Professor Hagedorn's lectures and I was very interested in a comment he made on the production of anti-helium. Many years ago, you must have calculated the production rate of anti-helium, and I guess that was in proton-proton scattering at fairly low energies. But as far as I understood it, you had a perfect, a very good explanation for that, having flavor equilibrium. There was nowhere a parameter to uh, take into account that you were away from equilibrium. So in your description, you could account for anti-tritium, anti-helium-3, all these very heavy particles at very low energies, but with perfect chemical equilibrium. So helium, to, in other words, what you're saying, Jean, to put it into 10-second statement, non-strange particles are in flavor equilibrium. And are very heavy anti-baryons. Yes, yeah. very heavy in, uh, in, so anti-helium is in flavor anti equilibrium. Anti-helium-3, anti-tritium. It was for, not for the plasma, it was low energy. Yes, but yeah. if it holds for such low energy in such a small system, why not for a much bigger but system at higher energies? Yes, but this is a very interesting question. Why is non-strange anti-flavor in equilibrium? It's helium yeah, I mean, just I just wanted to expand on that. This is also what I showed uh, a couple of days ago. That's the surprising uh, co coexistence of thermal equilibrium and flavor equilibrium as far as the up and down quarks is concerned, or anything that's being made up of. But then we also know that in proton-proton collisions, that is not true for the strangeness. The strangeness is not produced at that same rate that is expected from that kind of temperature. So there is this famous strangeness suppression that is being observed in proton, uh, proton and also proton nucleus collisions. And that is something that is being partially removed in the nuclear collisions and that is another answer to the question why is strangeness interesting. We are must raise some time. Some uh, remarks uh, by the next speaker, who is of course anxious. Uh, wait a second, I have just a, a, a comment on the lambda because uh, uh, he mentioned a, a kind of a theoretical lambda which was uh, compared with an experimental measurement. 
And uh, I think it's known already from the plus and minus collisions that if you have a theoretical lambda of the order of 0.3, that is S over, over light quarks, what you observe experimentally is 0.15. I put that in. This factor of two is famous. Robleski read back extrapolation from the final Yeah. Okay, because this depends just on the resonance decays which feed yeah. the light uh, quarks. Yeah. And then another, uh, a few days ago, uh, you, you talked about something that was mentioned a few days ago where I was not there, but uh, I, w I would like to add that if you look into the uh, charged particle multiplicities as a for a given event in the plus and minus also in proton-proton as a function of the particle mass, one finds an exponential behavior which an, uh, with an inverse slope which is uh, in the order of the standard temperatures, which is very interesting and to my knowledge it was uh, either it's uh, explained in this uh, way of Hagedorn or not explained at all. It's interesting that it happens also in two jet events in E plus E minus. Any comment? Mm. No? I agree. Okay, shall we move to the next topic? Or is, uh, yeah. I think the consensus is so. Now that we have a little bit division, so we're moving into division of opinion, obviously. <coughs> so the question is can we discover anything? You're looking at uh, strange particles or strange antibions or anything which is strange. And uh, since we went this way, the first one on this topic is Uli. Yes, um, what we certainly can measure directly is, or decide directly, is first we test whether the concept of thermal equilibrium continues to be true as it happens to have been observed in proton-proton collisions many years ago by Hagedon and many others. And then based on that, as I said, when once we have a temperature, we can ask whether we have also chemical equilibrium. And that is a question that we can decide. And that's the first thing that can be discovered, whether the, whether the time scales in nuclear collisions are such that we can reach chemical equilibrium. And then we take it from there. Then once we have established chemical equilibrium, then the theoreticians have to be asked, how could that have happened? No comment? I think as an experimentalist, the frontier is where uh, Uli has, uh, has said. I mean, uh, we, we can measure uh, ratios and see how far from uh, chemical equilibrium we are, or coming from the top, we could be above chemical equilibrium, or from below, and uh, then it's up uh, to somebody else to decide whether <laughs> the time scales are... Um, They, for example, hadron gas can produce anti-omega minuses in, the, in, the, in a reasonable time, or if you need plasma or something else. Well, hopefully we can discover that some models are wrong, if all goes well. I think the question was for theorists. The experimentalists on, only can tell you if you can measure a particle or a cross-section. The, the problem of the time scale is very, very important. And if you look to the different paper, this time scale don't, doesn't seem to be uh, fixed in a... So uh, uh, some people t t talk about a uh, uh, factor of uh, 100. Some other talk a uh, factor of, of 10 between the uh, time scale for the uh, strange equilibrium, uh, strangeness equilibrium and uh, the, the light flavor equilibrium. So uh, when you have a factor like this, this means that uh, probably the kinetic theory has to be <laughs> redone. I mean, uh, more precisely, more carefully. Uh, th this is, uh, to me, uh, a big discrepancy uh, to, to be ignored between the uh, different approach. So we falsify kinetic theory with conventional uh, Boltzmann theorem. That's what it is. <laughs> <laughs> Can you explain that? What do you mean? Sorry. Well, he really said the following. You have a kinetic theory, whatever kind. You have scattering them, which produces particles. There's a time scale in it. You produce these particles, you look at the experiment. There's difference in real. So something must be wrong. Either the kinetic theory is wrong, or the rates of production are wrong and the rates of production are based on the assumed uh, system, nature of the system. This, this is a very restrictive starting point, so 
many things can be wrong. Either the cross-section, <laughs> or, yeah. or the form of the collision term can be wrong, right. or the density that you assume. Correct, it's wrong. wrong. So, so, uh, it's That's exactly what he said. Mm -hmm. yeah, you can so, falsify that. Wait, 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 wait. So, no, wait, 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 it's extremely, so you say sigma, <laughs> you can say... Uh, sigma, the, the masses of the particles, which yes. means the thresholds, also, 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 which also enters into the... <laughs> What else? Densities? Densities. Yes. What else? The form of the collision term. The form? Okay. Two by two scattering mm -hmm. or something yeah. more complicated. Yeah. Must yeah. 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 Great. It's okay. okay. So you see, production. Yeah. wonderful. We have something to discuss. <laughs> <laughs> Which of these is important? Hack it on, just a second. I think on the theoretical side, there are also a lot of uh, uncertainties. For instance, the, uh, as Tunzi said, time scales are important. If you have, uh, well, also temperature is important. If you go up into the plasma, into a very high temperature, then the chemical equilibrium will be more easily restored than at low temperatures. Because first of all, the masses will decrease. Secondly, uh, if the Boltzmann factor, suppose you have an ideal gas and you create, create in that ideal gas heavy flavors, then the Boltzmann factor at high temperature is of course larger, at, small, at, at low temperatures it's smaller, and if it is larger you have a higher production rate and a faster approach to chemical equilibrium. So it depends very much on the individual collision whether you have reached a very high temperature or only a very low temperature, just above the threshold. Secondly, as it has pointed out by Danos and Rafelsky many years ago, the volume is very important for the uh, attainment of chemical equilibrium. If you have a large volume, then it is attained at a different uh, level than in a small volume, because in a small volume, if you cre create a strange, anti-strange pair, it has a chance to re-annihilate. In a big volume, it has not, because they fly apart. Okay. So you see, but I, 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 between uh, Heinz and Hagedon, we see that there is a very valid sort of analysis of a situation should be done in terms of uh, exactly these uh, primitives, is it called? <laughs> Professor Hakim is in agreement. We have to identify what are the important uh, degrees of freedom in this discussion, and I think we have them. I, I, first, we go through. No, finish. if he wants to continue, yeah? I have something else. Okay. No, I just wanted you wrongly translated my remark. It was uh, less ambitious than that. It was falsify uh, models, if you want, uh, a bit okay. in the spirit of what Stachel said before. Models. Thank you. Different oh, May I, may I make another little didactical remark? Which, what can be going wrong on the experimental side? This is talking to Professor Hagedorn. Um, if you measure particle ratios, as we oftentimes do, of course, in order to find out strange to non-strange ratios and so on, two things may go fundamentally wrong if you do not have a wide acceptance detector. And that is illustrated here. If we take, uh, if we take this thing here to be a rapidity plot of fireball products, of a fireball which sits, resides centrally at this rapidity, and this is minus two and plus two units from it. And in such a fireball at temperature 200, the anti-lambdas would have a, the a rapidity distribution which is in blue, the kaons in red, the pions in the third color. That is a sketch. In, at fixed temperature, the pions spread out much f further over phase space because they are relativistic, whereas the anti-lambdas are still totally non-relativistic. And so if you take, ra and so the integral of all these things is made to be equal. So in principle, this fireball has equal total abundance of anti-lambdas. I mean, this is a fun fireball here, of course. But now if you measure the ratios, you can get absolutely anything that you want if you stick to a too narrow rapidity interval. Point two, if you measure PT distributions, or me measure uh, in selected PT or KT windows, and take yield ratios, then the parent yield is concave, as we know, which is this famous low PT enhancement and the Cronin effect and whatnot. And the anti-lambda yield in PT would be some kind of shoulder arm structure. And so again, you can see that if you take ratios from this, you can get answers which are missing the target by factors of five. In other words, the pleat is as far uh, acceptance both in PT and in rapidity as you can attain. Otherwise, beware of comparing equal things. I'm sure someone is going to not agree with you. Well, <laughs> it would be hard. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry. I think 
and I said it be, uh, since 20 years, PT is not a good variable. You should take the transverse MT. mass. Yeah. Very good. That's the first uh, thing. Which was that, not cares, <laughs> that cures the system, so, is it a question somewhat? Ben, do you want to comment? You open already? No? No, no, no. <laughs> no. Not this. this no. Your neighbor. No. I don't, I don't disagree with Reinhardt. In fact, I absolutely agree with you. It's extremely important to measure these MT dependence and rapidity dependence. Yeah. And um, I think whether you use a 4 pi detector or you use a, 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 a spectrometer, which then you go and scan over the full rapidity region and, and go for the full MT region, you're absolutely right. It's absolutely essential to, to cover the whole phase space. Now, since no one dares to disagree. You may. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I will have an opinion, or perhaps Professor Kwercik? No, I fully agree. I mean, okay. uh, I would like to remark that, of course, into his comment, uh, as input, was a model. The model was a fireball. Therefore, I am as well allowed to use this input fireball in my argument. And if I do so, I can correct for using this model for any acceptance that any experiment gives me, and, and knowing the acceptance, make a model independent analysis as far as I can. So therefore, although I will know less, because of the less entropy will be observed, if you have small, small acceptance, I can extract under circumstances more precise information. No, I would like to disagree, Johan. We, we know from Hagedorn already for 20 years that, that in principle, one can leave out the longitudinal phase space and look at this thing as if it is boost invariant and put our fireballs everywhere on the axis. But I mean, talking about the CERN experiments, we know that we have a much more extended longitudinal than transverse phase space. So this single fireball model is just for fun. In reality, we have a mixture of fireballs spread over one and a half units, but still they have their spe specific and particular spreading to the outside. There is the example, which I think I remember from Professor Agedon, of the people looking, of the people, blind people, in front of an elephant, you see. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody touching a part of the elephant. So clearly, if you want a picture, you have to, you have, to you have to have the whole elephant, otherwise uh, you can get. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to make I would like to make a, a, a comment about the question model dependent or model independent. As I tried to point out in my first statement is what we can establish, and that is already within the model of thermal equilibrium, whether we have chemical equilibrium or not. But then in order to extract where, uh, where that comes from, I don't think there is a way of doing that without having an additional model. And that is because, as Tunzi pointed out very correctly, it's a question of time scales. And unless we can really measure the time scale independently, we will not be able to uniquely distinguish one model from another with different time scales, only within a certain range. So that brings me to the point that even strangeness should be complemented by other signatures which have more maybe direct more direct uh, information on the time scales experimental information on the time scales we will give you the opportunity to make a proper comment <laughs> So, so I'm doing that. I agree with Zuli, but I'd like to extrapolate his remark uh, and adding something to, to Rolf's yeah, remark. Uh, but I believe that uh, what we are avoiding permanently a very important point in theoretical discussions of any models. This point is ergodicity, but it's really very important, yeah. So dealing with the different, different time scales, we should keep in our minds that uh, so maybe sometimes we come to the non-ergodic systems in hadronic uh, physics. We didn't quite finish the round, exactly. Is it, talking here? Is it actually on? Yep, everything is on. Okay, uh, it's still on the subject of, of what it signals, but it's really a question and maybe somebody has an opinion on the subject is that as I speak as an experimentalist from an experiment where we where we measure primarily correlation functions of strange and non-strange particles including uh, including baryons and and one of my questions is if if we assume that uh, by the measurement of the radius parameter from one of these correlation functions I can associate that with the real size of the system 
uh, for and and to what extent uh, would members of this panel think that we should see a different size for kaons and pions and baryons? That is, should I see something different in this measurement for kaons and uh, and non-strange particles? Just a remark at the recent Helsinki meeting. I think some. I don't know, was it an, a universal agreement, but it was some kind of agreement that if you start, for example, with a hydrodynamic model and compute the expansion, then you have a freeze out of pions and kaons synchronously at the same time. You cannot do differently. Then you treat resonance contributions properly. They add more to the pion signal than to the kaon signal. And in the end, such a model, at least qualitatively, describes the observed difference between the effective radii extracted from the correlation functions. In other words, inverting the arguments that is not necessarily a proof of this of the suspicion that the chaos freeze out earlier and therefore the two observations show you some dynamics of the system i mean i'm sorry to to reflect this this kind of trivial explanation maybe it was not all the truth the subject is dead no but, uh, actually it's pleasant to meet you Reinhard, I just wanted to make a remark that I, I made earlier in the conference, and that is that there is nothing uh, that confines uh, the kaons or the pions to the fireball, which is very hot and which undergoes uh, a rather long uh, time, time scale expansion. And so that uh, there can be a spectrum uh, reflecting the thermal history of the fireball uh, before uh, the freeze out occurs. And that can give rise to different uh, temperatures and different uh, uh, thermal populations. Yeah, yeah, I fully agree in principle. In principle. Did we see it is a question. Radio Yerevan is off today. Uh, two comments to both Stock and uh, Norman. Um, number one, it's not true that you cannot implement in a hydrodynamic different freeze out for chaos and pions. It's just that people haven't done it, and even without separating that, we one can reproduce the difference in the observed radii because of the excess of, hat, uh, of resonance decay contribution in the pions, which is not there in the chaos. So you don't have to assume any different freeze out at the present stage. Uh, the other point is that uh, I don't think that you can have. Uh, I mean, the, we have a different concept of freeze out apparently, but I think particles that ha do escape have frozen out. The, uh, one should distinguish between a freeze out that happens simultaneously everywhere and a freeze out that happens conti continuously from an early time to a very late time. And I agree with Norman that in reality we should, we should expect such a picture that some particles freeze out or decouple from the system very early and others decouple very late. And therefore what, you, what is reflected in the data is an integral or an average of the, over that history. I should point out that our time is 15 minutes to go and we have lots of points to cover. So I would invite now incoherent comments. Anyone who has something to say to everything. Not to everything, but to the points uh, three and four. Uh, we are looking for a phase transition. Now, I think this, the most convincing sign of a phase transition is that the temperature reaches some kind of limiting value. Uh, suppose you have a pot where you can't look into and you wish you have a thermometer outside, and you wish to know whether the water which is in is going to boil. Well, when the thermometer goes to 100 degrees centigrade and does, does stop there, then you say, I am at the phase transition. Now, that has been observed since, I don't know, 50 years in cosmic rays for, for the first time with a limiting transverse momenta. And I think this is the most convincing sign that there is something. Now, what the details are, that is what we are after now. Any, uh, anyone directly to this? Yeah, let me give you an example. Um, things are not quite as simple, I think. If you take, for example, the evolution of the early universe, you know that there is a certain point beyond which we cannot look because the matter was in a plasma state and was not transparent to photons. So it could very well be that there's a certain density, and very likely it is, there's a certain density beyond which hadronic matter is so intransparent, so opaque, that particles basically are not emitted except from the surface, which typically will be somewhat cooler. Um, on the other hand, it does not necessarily imply a phase transition. 
as in the case of an electromagnetic plasma. So uh, the, there is still the question, is that a transition that is smooth or is it a phase transition? And now I would like to add one more uh, thing to point five. Um, I've tried to make that uh, point whenever I talked about strangeness. I think it is not sufficient to talk about deconfinement. It actually may be that strangeness is a very sensitive probe, a more sensitive probe even, of chiral symmetry restoration. Um, and in particular, uh, there is the strong evidence um, from lattice calculations and, and fundamental considerations in QCD that chiral um, symmetry breaking is due to instantons. Now, instantons generate an interaction that is flavor symmetric in between up, down, and strange quarks. And at the moment that we tamper with that structure of the QCD vacuum, um, and this hasn't been explored as far as I know in quantitatively, but it could very well be that this change in the structure of the QCD vacuum immediately leads to a flavor equilibration. Uh, I guess I'm going to make a, a heretical um, remark <coughs> uh, concerning the, um, the temperature. Uh, um, if you were to uh, uh, consider several different scenarios, one in which there was a limiting temperature due to an exponential rise in the uh, spectrum of, of, of particles, uh, or uh, some finite number of particles in which the temperature of the fireball could become very high. In fact, uh, what you finally observe in the laboratory uh, are the products of this fireball after it has expanded and cooled. And so I would claim that the common thing that you see and refer to as the um, the uh, uh, ultimate temperature of the body was actually the final temperature of the body, and it would be invariant for any kind of system, essentially given by uh, the uh, density of pions uh, when they can last interact, and that happens to be a temperature of 140 MeV, their mass. Professor Glenn Deming realizes that some people observe temperature of the order of 230 MeV. If one kind of slopes, 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 slopes. Yeah, boosted, as we heard from Heinz and as also I discussed in 1984 in Helsinki, by the, expan by the hydrodynamic expansion. I, 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 we are all aware of the intricacies of this problem and uh, it deserves its own lecture. No, he, he has talked less. Oh, well, I, I, I'll, I'll come to it. This is about temperature, because I have a different point. I, want to oh, I have also a different point. Oh. But I, well, I, now I, let's not make a contest. Uh, Samar Bernd, you, you said something about chiral restoration mocking up uh, or, or coming in the, in the place of a confinement. I have always had a, a, another naive question, which is also something to Hagedorn how in an entirely hadronic scenario we could get faster strangeness relaxation constants as we are normally considering a la Rafelsky. Our, our view of the relaxation time comes from basically consideration of a kaon pion uh, baryon gas. And then the, the relaxation constants for strangeness are very slow and long. But now at energy density of about 2 GeV per cubic Fermi, even if we stay with whatever hadronic scenario we would be in, I would guess that the mass spectrum that we are now looking at is shifted far, far higher. And in such, a, such an environment, the difference between the strange quark mass as a constituent quark and the ups and downs makes no difference anymore. K star intercommunicates with delta star much easier. There are no thresholds. There's not this Boltzmann penalty, or the, the Maxwell factor penalty. And so equilibration at this kind of 200, 250 initial hadronic temperature with high masses abundant in the system could be much, much faster. And we could mock up what we think could only be achieved in a plasma. Of course, uh, just let me say again as a chairman, uh, strong changes in hadronic gas equations of state, which would ensue, have to be noticed. You have always a greater than just one observable. I think Steve wants to say something about it. This is a different point. I mean, it's different point. Then we have to ask if there's anyone uh, to this point. 
and you want to uh, this famous issue of modified uh, hadronic gas equations of state and other observables. It has to be cross-checked, right? I, sh I can just say once more something which I think in Helsinki someone said. There's lack of evidence for this. Correct. A strong lack of evidence. Unless strangeness enhancement is the evidence for it. Comes. <laughs> Unless, well, but you see, one observable, you can, of course, build uh, everything on one observable. Yes, you have no restrictions. Steve. I just want to come, uh, come back to this point that I was making on Tuesday, which is sort of just from an experimental point of view, an operational thing, and that is that we see at the AGS that for the gold plus gold collisions, that the, the production of K plus essentially is just linear with the number of participants. This is somewhat surprising because we we would thought that the rescattering would increase the um, would increase the strangeness production, but in fact it's just linear with the number of participants, and so it, it it just becomes an interesting question as we get these lead beams at Cernus Fall. If one were to see, this is for the peripheral collisions here with a lower number of participants and central collisions here at high density, whether we wouldn't see something like this where we see uh, this linear again this linear behavior up until we reach some density, and then we see a, a, a break and a much faster rise in terms of the, the K plus production or the lambda production. And then I think if we saw such a kink like that, such a discontinuity, that would be very hard to explain that by any of our kind of conventional, <coughs> conventional scenarios. So I think this is kind of an opportunity to, 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 to see a signal. Do you see it or do you expect it? No, no, this is, this, is, this is future. This is what we see now, just the linear behavior. No, but I'm just saying this would be a, a, a possible signal. If we were to see such a kink, which is no, no, what we might expect. Strangeness enhancement means that we don't see linear behavior. So That's what I'm saying. This is the... This is the no, but the we see in sulfur sulfur. We have no linear behavior. Yes, you have linear behavior. Well, no, I think you have to be careful. Wait a minute. It cannot be linear behavior because then you have to cross at the No, 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 no. I'm not, no, no, I'm, no, I'm just talking about the number. Yeah, I'm talking about with the number of participants. We have to take some given reaction and look at it as a function of the number of participants. The ratio, the ratio a K on per participant yeah. is not constant if you go from nucleon nucleon to sulfur sulfur. So it means there is no linear behavior. So we clearly see that there's difference between AGS and SPS physics. I mean, one should record it in, uh, in memory. Uh, Professor Kwetzik has a microphone, and next I, will be... I. <laughs> uh, so, um, I mean, it's interesting, clearly, uh, I agree with, to look at uh, variation of yields of uh, strange bions, antibions, the function of the mass number of the projectile. However, I remember a letter from Rafelsky to the SPSLC where he was <laughs> mentioning that that's uh, only part of the story. The interesting thing would be to see the same, to look for the same uh, ratios and think as a function of the beam energy keeping uh, the uh, participant the same because that uh, theoretically would be easier to, and since the, 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 the subject is messy enough, uh, to simplify it by using only energy it would be. Could somebody comment on this? Um, essentially, is a Rafelsky. Uh, uh, no, I will not comment. I'll just try, uh, make clear what the question is, uh, because obviously it's an important issue which should be raised. And the point which uh, Emmanuel has just mentioned is as follows: Do we need excitation functions? of strange particles. And why? Hmm? Who has a comment to make? Maybe let Johanna. Johanna? I just want to show one transparency. I think the contents are known to people, but just to remind everybody, I mean, this is this a strangeness suppression factor that Reinhardt just showed before the SS bar over half the UU bar plus DD bar. And you see here the, the PP systematics and you see as a function of beam energy that both at the AGS and at the SPS strangeness is enhanced significantly. And at least as a function of energy we have these two points. Which right? point we have, 
This is AGS, so that's root S of about 5, 5.3, and that's the SPS, and it's for the same A. Right? It's sulfur on sulfur, and it's silicon on aluminum. So uh, we, we have two points, and, and it's not, the situation I think is no different. There's a factor two in either case. But this, uh, maybe people have op different opinions. That's the data. Yeah, I know opinions about what one can measure. Yeah. That's the data on one observable. The qu there are more than one observable. It's all strange particles. particles. It's incorrect. The statement is absolutely correct. The beauty of strange particles is that there are 20 strange particles. But this is all the strange quarks. Ah, yeah, but you see, when you measure all phase space, sometimes you average away the interesting feature. The elephant becomes one single box. I we want <laughs> to see the, uh, the nose. Ian, my question was uh, concerning the lead on lead at SPS, which is the new thing where for, for which data do not yet exist. So uh, I just wanted to stress the fact that it's not only as a function of the mass number of the projectile, but also of the square root of S. Uh, the, have the new data. The, here, you gave it to me. <laughs> I was so upset. <laughs> 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 Do we need excitation function? The, the answer is yes. The answer, why, why it's yes, that's a somewhat longer answer. I don't think actually that measuring the excitation function will be sufficient, but it's certainly necessary. And the point I would like to make, and that's coming back to something that was uh, said earlier, is that if we see something interesting going on in the strangeness, there's still the question remains, where does it come from? And we have discussed quark-gluon plasma, we have discussed all kinds of exotic modifications to the hadron gas. The thing that we can probably do is that we can exclude some models, for example, naive hadron dynamics in the way that we know it or that we think we know from proton-proton dynamics and to a large extent that has already happened. But then after that, uh, what are the guiding principles from there? And at the moment, the only guiding principle we have is that uh, we want to have as simple as an, an explanation of the non-standard physics that's going on. But whether that is then the true explanation is still not proven. And the, the reason why we cannot prove it is because we cannot see inside the fireball. We cannot see inside the region that is hot and it, that is maybe deconfined or that is strongly modified in terms of masses and widths. And uh, that's why I would like to urge that we should really think about combining all of this, in, okay, excitation functions, where do they come in? They come in in maybe restricting uh, the, the theories a little bit more and eliminating some other models, but still we are left with the same problem. We have to somehow look inside and we have to make sure that uh, what are the degrees of freedom inside and the only thing is dileptons and photons as direct probe. Grazina, and then we proceed to final comments. So I, I think what we really need is a, a strangeness saturation factor versus energy. We know that at CERN, at least with a certain model, we are approaching almost 100%. We know with some illegal extrapolation, the AGS is still probably uh, is it illegal because it's only one point for lambda and lambda ratio? So it's just basically from our, for our curiosity, if you like, you can calculate, but it's not can be taken very seriously yet. It's still very low. It's probably around 30, 40 percent. And now it's a question: Where is this transition takes place? Is it gradual? Is it is it uh, just the step function? And at this point, is answer to your question: If you have the saturation function, you have a one box which takes care for all phase space and all uh, strangeness which is produced. If, okay, the procedure will be as follows. I'll first ask for closing statements from the audience, and then from the... Okay. You want to respond in 20 seconds? 20 seconds, yeah. I, I don't understand the illegal extrapolation because in the, in the, in the gold plus gold experiment, the AGS, so we've measured the K plus over essentially almost the full rapidity range. So I think we have a very good handle on what the strangeness is at the, at the AGS. We so. need more than one ratio that is not constraining. Now we're talking about the total number of, of strange quarks. But the, 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 the strange quarks are dominated in the, in the, um, in the K pluses and the lambdas. So, so I think we have a pretty good handle of what the strange production is at the AGS. The 
we proceed to closing statements. We have a schedule, which means Professor Zondager, Professor Derado, Professor Feinbeck, Professor Hagedon, and then the round table. Please be as brief as you can. Um, regarding the experimental measurement of the uh, excitation function of whatever we are measuring, um, I think this is an important question and it takes some time of mental and other preparation before we can at CERN, for instance, think of doing a, a run at 50 GV per nucleon with lead or whatever other ion beam we will have. And I think that, I mean, this implies that the experiments get convinced that they can materially do it with what they have, and that we get convinced that we have to do it because it is a fundamental data. Uh, and uh, I think this assembly is important because it is the most favorable uh, um, meeting place uh, to reach such a decision. So if we want this, uh, we should uh, start today. Uh, this is an, uh, obviously an invitation uh, to meet at 11 in the evening or 11.30 to continue. <laughs> uh, I, I have one question. Is it possible from the heavy ion interaction to learn something without thermodynamic mode? Is there an immediate 30-second answer, any please? No. If gluon and quarks have been invented by theorists, therefore you cannot. <laughs> you cannot prove quark gluon, plasma without the real. No, I, I answer yes. I mean, uh, the uh, thermodynamic approach is, is one of the approach that uh, has given a certain number of results and give a uh, lot of uh, interesting things. but. Uh, uh, there may be, I'm sure there is other ways, of course, and there is, the, to tackle this, uh, this problem and to look for more, perhaps more precise mechanism acting effectively on the, during the collision. Feinberg, uh, <clears throat> two points. First, um, in the afternoon session, um, you, uh, if, I'm, uh, correct, if I understood you correctly, you are invited to speak about possible different um, state equation of hydrogen matter. Um, I will try to show that there exists a very plausible possibility that um, besides uh, hydronic uh, phase and, and um, uh, He's speaking about uh, taking off his time in the afternoon session. Is the chairman here? <laughs> Next point. Um, we actually have uh, to do with the uh, gas of uh, <coughs> uh, con uh, of uh, the confined constituent quarks. This is uh, with the different uh, with different state equation. So maybe um, there is something, uh, and uh, we really do have. Um, maybe we have it exactly at the present accelerator energies. He has 40 minutes in the afternoon to explain more precisely, but we have taken notice. Uh, two remarks, one to Derado. Uh, normally you can't measure things of which you have no conception, and therefore the thermodynamic concept, which is uh, probably the most popular one for today is uh, difficult to overcome. So you have to think hard to think of mechanisms which are not thermodynamic and which give you measurable things. Now the second thing which I really wanted to say is a uh, very naive uh, theorist picture of the future. You might be able to look for event by event to the uh, interactions of heavy ion collisions and to trigger not for centrality as you mostly do today in order to get much of the quark gluon plasma, but to trigger for medium impact parameters. If you can do that, let's say impact parameter one half, then you would know that in the extreme regions of the rapidity plot, you are dealing with hadron matter and you have not had a phase transition even if it was possible. In the 
inner part, you would have had a phase transition. And there you might distinguish in single experiments what is what. Yeah, but that, was, that, was, that was the point of this. You will have, you will have opportunity. We just run through. Just a second. Everyone makes a closing statement. Otherwise, we are out of bound. <coughs> I just wanted to comment on the analogy to looking at a piece of, of an elephant. I think if you take too many uh, if you take uh, many whole events, you can you run the danger of looking uh, uh, looking from afar at a herd of elephants that doesn't look so much different. But this is the point that doesn't look so much different than uh, than a, a herd of geese or something like that. As that that you must ex you must choose those events that you look at carefully and. I agree with Hagedorn. I think it's extremely important to look at the look at these reactions as a function of impact parameter. I think I think it is important to look at energy bombarding energy dependencies. But as you go up in energy, you go through thresholds for for different particle production and so forth. It's a little bit more model dependent. So the I think the impact parameter dependence is very important to go from uh, essentially the uh, essentially within a given thing that what looks like PP to the very central, very dense uh, collisions. I would like to just to underline that I think there is a need of lots of systematics, uh, which means measurements of PT dependence for PDD dependence, uh, impact parameter A and energy in great detail because uh, the margin between an enhancement and uh, the absence of an enhancement may still be just of the order of two. So the, the scale has to be known very precisely. Well, we have interesting experimental question in front of us. We have uh, started seeing interesting, th I'm talking for SPS, we have started seeing interesting things with sulfur. Now the question is, is was that all there was, there was to see? Are we somehow saturated or something more spectacular will happen with lead? And if you forget for the moment uh, about core gluon plasma, strangely by itself is a very is a tack of very interesting uh, reaction. So even if that will not end up with the uh, discover of the confinement, it's worth it. Well, uh, it seems clear that uh, you need a, a comprehensive experimental problem program if you want to have a handle on the core gluon plasma. However, this is not new. Uh, quark and gluons uh, have not been discovered in a single experiment, but a long program uh, was needed to bring to the concept. Mark? I would make my statement. At